but uh, we had a good time. If I seem a little out of touch today, my body is still on Arizona time. We were there just long enough to make the adjustment. I'm here. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking about you all last week, and I'll share a couple other things from the convention itself in just a moment. But I want to do something before that, because we have some special things coming up. Not this week, but the following week, we will have some go out from us to Pittsburgh to serve on a World Changers team. And so we want to pray for them as they prepare to go and as God prepares the field before them. I don't know if you're familiar with World Changers, but it's an opportunity uh, for people, young people, to go to an area to bond with each other in Christ and be able to do ministry to parts of the cities where they go to make a difference in people's lives and share with them the hope we have in Jesus Christ. And those who have gone and been a part of World Changers that we know over the years are forever changed by the experience. And they find that God uses them and it becomes a key molding block in their lives. And for the leaders that go, it becomes a real bonding with youth and with younger folks from the church to be able to instill in them a mentoring uh, as they go. And so be praying for that group as they head out, not this week, but next week. This week, since you ask, uh, as Bruce already mentioned, is Vacation Bible School week. If you are involved in Vacation Bible School this week, would you please stand for a moment? Everything from teaching, directing, providing. Uh, these individuals that you see standing here have made a commitment of themselves to make a difference in the lives of children uh, across this community. One, if not the one, number one, means to reach children with the gospel is Vacation Bible School. Baptisms, church leaders, those that God uses, even as missionaries, many have come through Vacation Bible School. Now, I am a product of two-week Bible schools. Remember those days? For two weeks, the first week you thought I'll never make it, and the second week you did. Now it'll go Sunday through Wednesday. So you pray for them because of the concentration of the time, but the opportunity with the children. Okay? Let's pray. You remain standing. We want to pray for you. So let me lead us in a time of prayer. Dear gracious God, thank you for these. Thank you for their commitment. Thank you for their preparation. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the children that you will bring this way. Some who may hear the name Jesus in a way they've never heard it before. Some whose eternities will be changed because of this week. Some whose destiny in this world will be radically changed because of this week. May they become soldiers of the cross. And may they reach the next generation to follow with your name. I pray for these leaders. I pray for their energy. I pray for the words, the divine moments you will give to them that will allow them to touch the lives of those who walk through the door to this place. Bring them. Draw them in a way that only you can do. Be with those even in the adult class as they hear and come. How you can use that time to reach a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa with the gospel while they wait for their child that they might hear the hope of the gospel as well. We're excited about this week and anticipate what you're going to do and say. Be with these and theirs, I pray. Be with our team as they go to Pittsburgh the following week. Use them, give them safety, and give them wisdom and opportunity to tell of the hope that we all have in Jesus. Guide us now, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. If you will... Um, Look at the screen. I want to tell you a couple things that happened at the convention this week. The one part I think that was the most exciting for us 
was the commissioning of missionaries. Uh, they have the ceremony in the evening, and it was just rich. It was personal for us. It's personal for us here in Ohio because we have lived through the day where we have first-generation missionaries going from Ohio to the ends of the world. You may know Jeff and Barbara Singerman. Uh, they have served with the International Mission Board for many, many years. Their children have grown. The picture you see is the commitment of Kevin and his wife, Vicki Singerman, the son and the daughter-in-law of Jeff and Barbara, who were set aside to go on to the mission field. If you'll notice in the background, see some of the folks in the shadows? We never did get to see their faces because they're going to portions of the world where it is a dangerous place to be a Christian. And they're going in to do missions, uh, some as business people, some as missionaries, as you might think, to be able to help plant churches. But as they stood on the stage, their identity could not be revealed beyond their first names. And I always am amazed at every commissioning service. And I watch these young families who sense God calling them out of their comfort zones. And because I'm now a parent, grandparent of parents and grandparents that are letting them go. You say, well, I don't know if they're actually letting them go. Well, they kind of have to, don't they? But all the family that's impacted because God says go. David Platt, one of the things he said that really spoke to my heart, he said, we think about being missional where God's planted us. And that's true. You and I have a place where God's put us to be a missionary to our neighbors, to our neighborhood, to all the open doors that he gives us to be the light of the gospel to those that are around us in darkness. And he said, but think about this. If all we are is a missionary to the here, how will they ever hear over there? And so there is that sense of calling that God says to his church, we want to reach our area. But we truly want to have a heart for the unreached people groups and for the places that have never heard the gospel. Someone did a video clip and said that, and not at the convention, but some time back, and they said, if we simply said the name Jesus to every person in the world, the hundreds of years it would take for every person in the world to hear the name Jesus once. That's profound. So this commissioning service uh, is always a special time for us. We were able to go through, excuse me, go through one at the uh, in Richmond at the International Mission Board. This one was special because of Kevin and Vicki. So you pray for them as they go and as they continue to prepare for what God has before them. There were several things that were discussed. Kenny and I were talking about it beforehand. We didn't make every single business session, and so there may have been some things that we missed. But what we did hear was phenomenal. To hear how Southern Baptists have a desire to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and reach the world with the hope. Probably the most radical thing, if you heard anything in the news, came about because of a misunderstanding that the news there in Arizona kind of exploited. Um, and that's where we stand on racial issues. And just to be clear, we're all of the human race. Christ died for the world in order that we might know him and know him personally. And there was the declaration to make sure that we understood and that the world understood. We are not racist. <laughs> I just find it amazing I even have to say that because the gospel is for all people. I've walked amongst all people and seen how God's changing lives of people. But that seemed to kind of steer us for a little bit in that direction. Had the opportunity to be a part of the WMU um, meetings and events and just to hear their hearts and I'm going to tell you a story before the message is over today about one way that WMU was brought in in order for the gospel to continue to spread to the ends of the earth. 
So, with that said, thank you for your prayers. We headed down to Tucson, uh, where our daughter and son-in-law live, uh, after the convention, and spent some days with them, and just had a delightful time. Flew in yesterday. Yesterday. Uh, we left out there in the morning and got home last night. And the incredible thing, the night, I got to tell you this, this, this is no sermon stuff, it's just what happened. Um, the night before we left, um, our daughter, Lauren, was taking care of the pets. And she walked them one last time Friday night. And they and a skunk met up. Three dogs, one skunk. One skunk, three dogs. And so she called us at about midnight here, and she was frantic. Uh, her, her boyfriend came over, Elijah, and they worked diligently and scrubbed the dogs. In. Well, literally, when we got home, we couldn't smell it on them. But let me tell you, the skunk got them. And um, so we came home to that last night, and it's so good to get back. <laughs> Take your Bible, if you would, and open to Luke, the 8th chapter. This being Father's Day. I, I, this is a message for dads, but every one of us need to be an influence. Every one of us need to seize the opportunity of those around us of influence for the gospel. You cannot look in the gospel and say there's ever a time or place where we are not called of Christ to be an influence. Not a burden. Not a looking down our nose at, but to be an influence with the gospel and of the gospel on the lives of others. There was a time my parents were not Christians, I can remember as a little boy. And there were those who became a Christian influence on my parents. Um, Deacon Hal down at the local bar barbershop, or excuse me, Deacon Lowe. Deacon Lowe down at the local barbershop would set my dad in the chair and start cutting his hair. My dad had a wide part down the middle, so it never took him as long as he took. I'd be there in the chair bouncing around. Mr. Lowe would say, you know, Don, you're raising that boy there. You need to be a positive influence on him. It's more than just life itself. My dad would go, yeah. There were those who were an influence on my mother. You see, it's because of Christian influence, not magic, mysticism, or accidental, that they came to know Christ. Thus, I came to know Christ. You see the ripple effect? So for all of us, we have the opportunity to be an influence. This being Father's Day, I want to draw attention to one particular father for just a few moments, who was a definite influence and seized the moment. You recognize the picture, the background up there? Ozzie and Harriet? Remember those days, everything worked. Everything was just in the right place at the right time. I always look back on those shows, and Donna Reed, she always wore a dress all day long. Leave it to Beaver. Mom and Dad were always at their finest. Life's never been like that for me. Has it been for you? But we still think there's some magic dust that brings that about. But what I want to declare is Christ and the gospel enables us to live a life that honors the Father, the Heavenly Father, and demonstrates Himself through us. So if you would, look at this passage, this next picture, just the influence that's on me. That's my dad with Justin, our eldest. Justin is now 33, I think, something like 33. My father went home to be with the Lord back in 1993. They came to visit us, and just the preciousness of this picture. I hope that you have some precious opportunities to be an influencer to those around you. Justin's now the father of three. <laughs> 
and continues that trend along. Look, look at this passage with me, if you would. And I'm reading, um, we each got a new Bible while we were at the convention. And this is the Holman Standard uh, Version. Um, and so if, if you go on to that next slide, um, I'll be reading from that. It'll be a little different uh, than what you have, or if you've been following me along in the ESV, you'll notice the difference. Look at these words out of Luke chapter 8, verse 40. When Jesus returned, and this is a series of verses of Jesus as he just mingles amongst the masses. When Jesus returned, the crowd, they welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Just then, in that very moment, in that instance, a man named Jairus came. He was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and he pleaded with him to come to his house because he only had one daughter about 12 years old and she was dying. He came to Jesus pleading, you've got to do something. Let's pray together. Dear gracious God, thank you for this day. Thank you for a time in your word. Thank you for these, your precious people. I pray that you'll take this time and set our hearts aside to hear you. And that as we go out from here, we'll live for you. Thank you for the events of this past week. Thank you for the opportunities and joys of the week before us. May we always be about the Father's business. Thank you that you are our Heavenly Father that we can know personally. Guide us through this time, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me tell you a story. As you look at this next slide, there's a, a TV, you've watched 60 Minutes, and a while back, 60 Minutes did a program, one of their slots, about the problems with African elephants. The way they discovered this problem, uh, the locals began finding these very rare uh, ivory-nosed rhinos dead. Uh, over 30, 35 rhinos killed. Uh, they thought it was poachers. They thought it was uh, some kind of vandalism, maybe a group of uh, youth who were just out causing mischief. And, and what they discovered, it was none of that. It was the elephants. You see what had happened. The poachers had come in and killed off the older dominant males in the elephant tribe. And when they did all the younger elephants, they just became juvenile delinquents. To put it in the words that were expressed within the program, uh, it, as time went on, the researchers have observed that these, many of these young elephants, they began to roam together in packs, and they began to do things elephants normally don't do by nature. They threw sticks and water at the rhinos. They attacked them. They acted like neighborhood bullies. They knocked down trees. They threatened others. They raised the noise level. I, I'm still talking about elephants. Um, and they raised anxiety in the park. Without dominant males in the tribe, they became excessively aggressive, exhibiting overly aggressive behavior. A few of the young males grew especially violent, attacking non-aggressive rhinos and stepping or kneeling on them and crushing the life out of them. To swell the destruction, the park rangers eventually had to kill the gang leaders. This left the young elephants even more disoriented and confused. So the park rangers theorized this, that these young teenaged elephants were acting badly because they lacked a dominant male role model. 
They eventually devised a solution and they brought in a large dominant male to lead them and to counteract the abnormal behavior. After a few years of the new male leadership, the young bulls returned to their natural role in the tribe. The killings stopped and the wildlife was preserved. Let them that hath ear hear. The vital importance of a role of influence, of a male role of influence, even in the animal kingdom, makes such a world of difference. When we consider our opportunity of influence, let me give these to you rather quickly. Next slide. How to influence your world. Number one is to live with passion. When we see this passage of Scripture in Luke, and you can find this same story in the Gospel of Matthew, but we're looking at the one in Luke. Look on it down. It's not on the slide, but look on down past verse 40. Look down to uh, verse 49. Now, Jesus is is dealing with the woman with the issue of blood and some other challenges of people coming up to him. In the midst of everything going on, in verse 49, while he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue's leader's house. We're going to talk about him in a minute. And said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard it, he answered and said, do not be afraid. Only believe and she will be saved. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. When you read this story in the Gospel of Mar or Matthew, you find in Matthew, you, he says everybody's already lamenting the death of this young girl. So this wasn't something that she had just passed out and came back. There was a period of time of preparation that takes place here. In verse 53, they laughed at him because they knew she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called out, Child, get up. Her spirit returned and she got up at once. Then he gave orders that she be given something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he instructed them to tell no one what had just happened. Three things I want you to see. First of all, as you and I want to live our life as influencers, we must live it with passion. Look at this father. This father was one who took care of daily operations, ordered orderly uh, conduct within the synagogue. He took care of the custodial duties. He was able to minister in the synagogue. This man had a full-time job. But when it came to his 12-year-old daughter, nothing mattered more. I've always said, you really have nothing to live for till you know what you want would die for. You have nothing worth living for until you have something worth dying for. All of the things in his influence in the temple meant absolutely nothing to him. His daughter is dying. Now, it's also believed that this wasn't the first time he, had met, he and Jesus had met up. Because of his role in the synagogue, he was aware of who Jesus was. They may have even spoken before, but in this moment in time, his passion rose to the surface where he said in desperation, Excuse me, I've got to speak. Jesus, my daughter is right at the doorstep of death. You must come. Isn't it amazing how at those points we don't really feel embarrassed? You know, sometimes we do things and we think, oh, I'm so embarrassed. There are times we don't care about embarrassment, do we? I remember when I pastored churches, um, in one church we pastored, the parsonage sat right next door to the church. It was made of the same brick as the church. Everybody that came through knew that church and that was the parsonage. And so we would have people come to our house all the time for help. There would be times I would also be sitting in my office and see a car pull up. We'd be at our house and see a car pull up. And I can't tell you the number of times that as I'd look out the window, I'd see the man look over at the woman and go, come on, Bert. come on. And she'd come up to the door ashamed, head hung. Reverend, yes, ma'am. 
um, a family were just passing through, were having a hard time. The story I had heard over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And one of the things the Lord always had to guard my heart was I didn't become callous to need, genuine need. But I did want to be a discerner. And I would listen to their story, and when they'd finish, I'd say, uh, Ma'am, I'm so sorry for your plight. If you'll go back out and ask, is, is that your husband? Is that your man? Yes. If you'll go back and ask him to come up and talk to me, I'm sure we can do something. She would go back to the car and I'd listen as the car would screech out of the driveway or out of the parking lot. Never one time, never once, did the man ever say, all right, and open the door and walk up on behalf of his family and declare, Sir, I'm embarrassed to have to do this, but my family needs substance. Would you help us? I'd have done it in a heartbeat. I'd already made the decision. But he sent her up there, and I thought, where's the passion for those you say you care so desperately about? Not one time, not once. And it broke my heart. In this story, Jairus gets there. He doesn't send his wife. He doesn't send a committee. He doesn't send someone from the synagogue. He throws all... He's a religious leader. He's got a reputation. Doesn't matter. His daughter. And he goes up and he goes, excuse me, gotta, you, you got to give me a minute with Jesus. Because right now, my heart is caving in. If you want to be an influencer, find the passion. You say, I don't really have a passion. Find it. It's there. We've buried it. We've been told to ignore it. We've been kind of intimidated not to show it. But that passion burns that says, I desire to be more of an influence than anything else on behalf of those that are around me. And that could be your family. It could be your friends. It could be your spouse. Kira says, I want some time with Jesus. And he lives out of his passion. But he also, look at this second thing. In verse 50, he lives out of his presence. He tells him what's happened. And in the midst of the story, when you read it in Matthew's gospel, Matthew indicates he already knew she was dead. But isn't that just like a dad? Isn't that just like a mom? That it looks beyond hope. Everybody else has already given up. But this dad says, listen, I still think there's something there that's redeemable, reachable, transformable. Yeah, she's gone already. No, no, no. I'm holding out hope. I'm holding out belief. And if anybody can do it, this guy can. And he's in the presence of Jesus. And he says in verse 50, Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. Only believe. She'll be saved. That's pretty potent words from a man who's never seen how sick his daughter got. Do you have maybe a son or daughter or friend, family member that you just feel is beyond the point of redemption? You're kind of giving up on them. Thinking they'll never turn it around. Jesus says, don't be afraid. You believe, they'll be saved. You hold out hope and you trust and say, God, you're in the redemptive business. Other people go, anybody will turn, that's not them. The times I've been on trips in sporting events and I, I meet somebody, a guy, and we start talking. And I think I've told you this before, the number of times, I can't tell you the number of times, a guy will look at me somewhere in the course of the conversation and he'll kind of snicker a little bit and he'll go, my mom ain't going to believe this conversation I'm having with you right now. Or my sister is not going to believe the conversation I'm having right now. I'll say, why is that? 
Well, you got to understand, I'm the black sheep of the family. <laughs> Every time I'm with them, they say they're praying for me. Every time I'm with them, they tell me I need to trust Jesus, and I just kind of blow it off. And here I am sitting talking with you about the very person I said I have no time for. Well, maybe I'm the answer to their prayer. Did you ever think about that? Never did. Never did. You see, in the midst of this, he understood he was in the presence. And if there was anybody who could speak hope to him, it was Jesus. If there was anyone who could give him a word that he could hook onto and ride all the way back home, it was Jesus. And he was in the presence. Sometimes I'm afraid we just become comfortable with the familiar rather than moved by the presence. Rather than being stirred by who he is and what it is he's doing in our midst. And so we don't see it. We kind of become blind to it. Do you know what I mean? We just, we don't see opportunities he gives us. We don't see his hand at work. We, we just kind of think, okay, God, you're my shade in my window. If the sun shines too bright, I'll pull you down and let you block that out so I stay comfortable. Or if there's not enough light coming in, Lord, I'll pull the shade up so the light can come. We just kind of find him as a convenience rather than Savior. Jairus when your presence is vital to me. Your presence is survival for me. Your presence is what my daughter needs. Please come to my house. Have you noticed something about our house? It's our kingdom. It's our kind of our castle. Somebody comes to your home and it's a privilege. If I walked up to your house today and just opened the door and walked in, you might recognize me, but you might say, and what do you think you're doing? Well, the door was unlocked. It was closed, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, because our home is where we kind of let ourselves relax and take our shoes off and He's saying, Jesus, come to the place that is the most intimate to me. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. <laughs> don't, don't worry, just believe. She'll be saved. Look at this third point I want you to catch. Third point I want you to catch is that you live your life with Jesus. If you want to be an influencer, you live it with passion. You live it with his presence. And you live your life with Jesus at every single point and junction along the way. In verse 54, he goes into the, to the house. And as I've already said, over in Matthew's gospel, it says the musicians had set things up. They were playing. Everybody was starting to gather. You know in that day they had professional mourners who would simply come come to a burial or to a death and they would sob and they would weep out loud in order that people might know of the agony of the soul at the point of death and the loss of that which was so precious. That was already in place. They had had some time to get things ready. Jairus was not about to accept that. <laughs> So Jesus, in verse, the earlier verses, he's, he's kind of heading that way, and all of a sudden, in the midst of going over for that need, he goes, who touched me? So somebody back here just touched me. Who was? And it wasn't just they reached out and touched his shoulder. He knew something had gone out from him. And there was a woman who had an issue of blood for many, many years, and no one could ever cure or take care of that. And she said, if I could but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. The moment she did, he knew it. And he turned around and he said, who touched me? And all of a sudden, she's ashamed because she wasn't showboating. She wasn't trying to get all this attention. She was embarrassed by the fact now that all eyes were on her. So Jesus had a story in the midst of the story. Do you ever find your life like that? If we could take them one story at a time, it'd be a whole lot easier, wouldn't it? But in the midst of going to Jairus' house, he has another need. 
and he's got his full attention. And then when he turns and gets back on the road and they get to Jairus' house, Jesus walks in, see all this stuff going on. People are just starting to laugh. <laughs> You're going to do what? She's dead. Jesus said, you all get out. It's just a couple of the disciples, mom and dad, in the room. He didn't need an audience. He wasn't doing it for CNN to run on the evening news. Not that they would have. He just wanted the point to be made. This man is passionate about this girl. His daughter. What would happen in one generation if this dad and this dad was passionate for that one child above everything else? What would happen? I know we all have lives and busyness going on just like he did. But to come to the place where we live our lives because nothing else matters but here. That's hard to do. It's hard to do as a pastor. As you seek out your next pastor, one of the challenges that comes as you seek a pastor is thinking, well, he's on call 24-7. But when you call a pastor and he has a need, he may say, I need, my kids need me today at their ball game. And you go, oh, but I need you too. Understand, he's reaching his generation just as much as the church at large. Do you understand? It takes all of us together. It takes him to be a dad as well as a pastor. So he took her by the hand. Once he got the room cleared, Jesus took her by the hand and called her, Child, get up. She got up. He said, Feed her. She's a teenager. She needs something to eat. <laughs> Transformation. Because one man chose to be an influencer to those that were closest to him. I don't know who that is for you. Could be a child, could be a friend, a work associate, be an influencer. Let me, let me close by telling you about Molly. Molly, um, we got to hear them. I'll tell you real quick how they came about to come to the WMU. Um, Molly is over in Nairobi, Kenya, Africa. And Molly, when he was a six-year-old boy, went to bed one night with his two brothers, his mom and dad. His dad was an alcoholic and would beat his mom all the time and just intimidated. It was a small village, but it was tight family village, and a lot of alcoholism was rampant in the village, but his dad was one. He went to bed one night, and when he woke up the next morning, his brothers, his mom and dad were gone. They decided to start a new life without Molly. And they left him. Little six-year-old boy. Went to his uncle's hut. When he got to his uncle's hut, his uncle, who also was an alcoholic, told him to get away. He didn't have any food for him. And so as a six-year-old boy, he learned how to steal and connive and sneak around and find some way to survive because no one in the village would take care of Molly. As an early teen, he heard that in Nairobi, there were jobs, and so 40 miles from his village, he started walking. For three days, he walked from his village to Nairobi to find work. Finally found a Hindu woman who took him in, allowed him to start cleaning floors for her. Found out he had some leadership abilities and brought him to a place where he oversaw the garden. While he was tending and leading the garden team, his future wife was there, and they met, and they married. They became Christians through a Christian witness. In Nairobi, he noticed that there were people who had to walk everywhere and transportation was very poor. So he went out with the money he had saved and bought a rickety bus and started a bus business. Long story short, it became a million dollar business. He had buses running all over Kenya. He had hired an entire staff. He also noticed that people needed some work, so he bought, bought an old wood mill and started training young men how to do woodworking. Became a million dollar business. He then saw the need for some steel structure, so what he did is he took the steel, bought a steel plant, a little factory that was there in, Ken, in Nairobi, turned that into a million dollar business. He and his wife and their eight naturally born children built the biggest house in Nairobi. It was a, a fortress. I mean, they had a walled house that was the biggest in the city. He was known for his entrepreneur abilities. 
but something kept tugging at Molly's heart. The street kids. One day he went into the city for business. A couple of thugs offered to watch his car if he would pay them bribes and he refused and he came back out and all that was left of his car was broken glass. Car gone. So what he was moved to do is he rode one of his own buses back to his home. Someone's got to do something for the street kids. So at dinner, once God had kind of showed him what he was to do, he sat down with his eight children and his wife and the servants were bringing the food. And Molly said, God has shown me to sell all of the businesses and to start ministering to the street kids. And his children said what you would expect them to say. Say what? At night... He would go into the poorest parts of the city and he'd look under overpasses or foundations to houses and he'd say, come here, come here, come with me. And he would take anywhere from three to five, maybe six children home every night. And that was okay because they had a little extra room at the house where the kids could stay. But all of a sudden, he did this every night. And finally, these children were moving into the rooms of his own children. And you know what they said. What are you doing? His children didn't quite catch what was going on. And they continued to bring children home to, for the sake of time. Charles, which he goes by now, and his wife have now taken in over 12,000 children off the streets. Some who have become doctors, educators, involved in the political system. It's amazing what some of the children have become. His own children, who kind of grew a little frustrated with him, said, Dad, we want nothing to do with this. And so they distanced themselves from him. They still would do work for him because there were still funds. But one day his wife came to him and said, Honey, the food is gone. The money is gone. We cannot buy no more. See, they had to buy the food. They had to brought, have brought in tanks of water because they were in the desert. They had moved out and built this uh, complex for the children to live. And she says, There's no more food. He said, we've prayed before, we'll pray again. The next morning, the children heard a noise at the gate to the compound. They opened up the gate and in drove a large truck. And a lady was in the truck and she said, I don't know you, you don't know me, but God told me to bring this load of food to you. And it was full of potatoes and cabbage and rice. And she said, he also told me to give you $5,000. <laughs> Again, I mentioned they had no water, so what he did is he had teams come in and drill holes in the ground to try to find the wells, and they couldn't find any. So he and his wife prayed and said, God, we need water desperately. He and his wife went walking out one night, sensing God was speaking to their hearts, and he walked out to a spot somewhere on the grounds, and he stopped and he looked at her and he said, the water is here. God has said, the water is here. The next day, his boys, who were working for him, started digging, and they dug, and they dug, and they dug. For several days, they dug, and they found nothing. They looked at their dad, and they said, I think you're crazy. There's no water here. The, where they've dug, the poles thousands of feet deep are just right off from here. There's no water here. He said, God said, dig, dig. And one day, as they dug, they hit a rock. And when they hit the rock, the water started to flow around it. And suddenly it started spouting up out of the ground. This was in 1990. They still use that well today. It still is bringing water. Molly, people heard Molly's story. So they wanted to capture it. They wanted it to become theirs. They wanted to own it. Molly said, that's not what God's brought me here to do. But then he heard of a group called WMU and knew they were into missions. And they wanted, they were putting this documentary together of the story of Mully and his journey and his walk in faith with God. And he said, I know WMU, his people said, I know WMU 
does mission stories. And so they've written a six-week study to follow up the Mully movie, which is coming out in September of this year, but available to churches prior to that time. We heard him speak that night. Humble folk. Simple-minded. Go to the next one. I had an opportunity to get my picture taken with Charles. Had that smile every time we saw him. Talked with the person who's the point person for them here in the States, Craig. They live, he and Kim, his wife, live in Alpharetta, Georgia, and Dean and I had a chance to talk with him the next morning. I said, I want to get Mully here to tell his story. He said, we can make that work. I tell you Mully's story because Mully chose to influence the very place he had come from. 67 years of age. Doesn't look a day over 66, does he? He's an influencer. You sense his passion, you sense the presence, and you sense he walks with Jesus. And he's just a guy who decided to be the dad to 12,000 homeless kids. And still they take him in. Now his children, who have all become believers, they, take a, they, they drive the operation. He and his wife are able to travel around and tell the story some more or where. And I thought, how appropriate, just before Father's Day, to hear Molly's story. To be able to say, any one of us still have an opportunity to be an influencer to those closest and those that need it the most. My prayer is that we say, God, how would you use me to be an influencer to make a difference in somebody's life? Let's bow together in prayer. Dear gracious God, thank you for this day. Thank you for a time in your word. I pray that as you speak, we'll be obedient. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Call us to be influencers. It means changing, moving out of our comfort zone in order to make a difference in the world close to us and on the other side of the globe. Use us, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we stand together and sing, Bruce leads us. I'll be here at the front. I challenge you to step out and say, Lord, make me an influencer in the world where you've planted me today.